Okay, right, we are live. Hey, Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for sharing your word with us and help us see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. So, I found a small video which does a nice job explaining just how and the timing the Hebrews could get across the desert. Um, oops. In this video, we want to explore if it's possible for the Israelites to travel from Ramses to the wilderness of Sinai in Saudi Arabia in the amount of time the Bible says it took. This journey is about 685 kilometers. The Bible says they had 45 days from the time of leaving Ramses until they entered the wilderness of Sinai. That would give the Israelites about seven total weeks of being on the road. My personal feeling is that God, from the very first step they set out, set up the idea of a Sabbath rest. They could travel for up to six days and nights, but on the seventh day, they had to rest. Exodus 12 is the start of their journey. And for the first seven days, they had to eat unleavened bread. If you see the 14th day to the 21st day, this is a seven day pattern. So those Sabbath days were non-travel days. So from the 45 possible travel days, we need to take off at least six Sabbath day rests. So they would have now 39 possible travel days. God did give the first official Sabbath rest one month into the journey when the people were in the wilderness of sin. We also know that one camp, Mahra, was a three-day journey. The Bible mentions no camping for three days. So after crossing the Red Sea, they did not stop. They traveled on to Mara, traveling with no camps for three days. We know that the Israelites stayed in the wilderness of Sin and Rephidim, split rock, for a longer period of time. They probably stayed a little bit longer before crossing the Red Sea. The Bible does not tell us how long they stayed at any of these places. So let's just take off 15 days of possible travel days for these three longer stops. Again, the route from Ramses to the wilderness of Sinai is about 685 kilometers. That means in the 24 days that the Israelites were traveling, they would have to go about 29 kilometers per day. That is possible. At five kilometers an hour, they would have to only walk for a total of six hours during that 24 hours. Some Israelites went slower than the five kilometers an hour, but they still could have traveled the needed distance. From the book of Acts, we know that Peter and others traveled from Joppa to Caesarea to see Cornelius. Joppa to Caesarea is about 61 kilometers. So Peter walked around 31 kilometers per day. What do we know about their journey? Because of the pillar of fire and the pillar of clouds, the Bible says they could travel by day or by night. So we know that they could travel for longer periods of time. Lawrence of Arabia traveled across the Saudi wilderness in a very distinct style. They would rise very early to travel in the cool of the day. Then in the afternoon, they would stop and sleep next to their camels. When the heat of the day lessened, they would continue on their journey into the night. They did not have God's clouds to cool them by day or their fire to lead by night but they traveled in this very fashion. They did not set up camps. They rested in the heat of the afternoon in the very late hours of the night. 
From Ramses to the Red Sea, there are not any multiple days recorded. It is assumed this part of the journey they traveled longer hours, faster and harder. Any backpacker or person who do long multi-day hikes knows that their feet are crucial to protect and care for. The Bible says their feet did not swell. I would guess this means that they didn't get blisters as well. The Bible goes on to say their sandals did not wear out. Overall, their feet seem to be supernaturally protected by the Lord God Almighty. In the wilderness of Sinai, we know that they had wagons or carts and oxen. These must have come from Egypt. The common view is that all the Israelites walked this whole way. But the wagons are signs that they had the ability to carry more things and the more fragile the society. Maybe they even had camel carts as well. In Exodus 14 is the story of Pharaoh going after the Israelites and catching up to them at the Red Sea. In July of 1917, Lawrence of Arabia, accompanied by eight others, traveled the 260 kilometers across the Sinai Peninsula from Aqaba via the Mitla Pass to the city of Suez in 49 hours. So if nine military men could cross this path in just over two days, it seems very possible that, that the Jews who were slaves, who worked long hours, could cross the same area in two to three weeks. It seems like that Pharaoh could have caught up to them at a much faster pace. So it is possible that Mount Sinai could be in Saudi Arabia, given the time needed to travel. The journey is definitely doable with the distance given within the days recorded in scriptures. And then, remember I was, we were talking about the wilderness of Shur, the wilderness of sin, and um, this little video explains the how wildernesses work, which I, I didn't realize, I always wondered how you could tell one wilderness from another. And it has to deal with watersheds. The Bible specifically mentions different wildernesses in the book of Exodus that the Israelites traveled in after crossing the Red Sea on their journey to the camp in front of Mount Sinai. This area in Saudi Arabia is extremely mountainous with tall peaks and dry riverbeds all running in different directions. The book of Exodus specifically mentions three wildernesses, the wilderness of Sur, the wilderness of Sin, and the wilderness of Sinai. So where are these wildernesses? During the time when King Solomon was building ships, the Bible identifies this body of water the Gulf of Aqaba as the Red Sea. The Bible says in Exodus 15, 22, they crossed the Red Sea and came to the wilderness of Sur. That would put the Israelites in current day Saudi Arabia. So this area in red is a different watershed or wilderness from anything around it, going from peaks that are over 1,500 meters tall to sea level the wilderness of Sur. In the book of Numbers, it says they crossed the Red Sea and traveled for three days in Etham. It is not clear why Exodus and Numbers use different names, but maybe Etham is a bigger, larger area than Sur, making Sur a part of Etham. So maybe the wilderness of Sur might be a smaller wilderness, while the area of Etham would make up a much larger geographical area. Geographically, this whole area has mountains and valleys all running to the beach and to the Red Sea. The next wilderness the Israelites enter is the wilderness of Sin. This green area is one large wilderness. This is the way the water flows in this wilderness. Okay, there really is not a river that is flowing, 
But if it rained hard enough, water would flow in this direction. From the eastern top of Jebel Mekla to the sea is some 180 kilometers. This makes up one wilderness, the wilderness of Sin. Next is the wilderness of Sinai. The wilderness of Sinai is where the Israelites camped for almost a year. The water in this orange area all flows to the city of Tabuk. Let's call this the Tabuk watershed. But a very small part of this wilderness could very easily be called the wilderness of Sinai. In Exodus 19.2, it says they camped in front of the mountain. So as they camped, they were in front of Mount Sinai. This is the view of Jebel Mekla from the east in the very wilderness of Sinai. This is the only spot in this whole area that you get this expansive view of Jebel Mekla. So here in Saudi Arabia, the physical land fits the biblical witness, the wilderness of Sur, the wilderness of Sin, and the wilderness of Sinai. But that was kind of interesting. Pulled it together so you could see where they were sitting. And there was another one somewhere that actually showed where they could camp and it showed it from the mountains backwards. I have to learn how to clip a little bit better. It might come up too. Anyways, so now um, we're we're getting ready for the we we just had the uh, bitter waters that, and we had the Amalekites the war with them um, that'll be everything going so bread from heaven so they journeyed from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin which is between Elam and Sinai and on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. It gives you about six weeks right there, approximately. Can you believe it's only been a little over a month since the Pesach dinner, the death of the firstborn? It's only been a little over a month at this point. We've death of the firstborn, all the plagues, Red Sea, much less the cloud of smoke during the day and the fire by night. I'm going to go out on a limb and say this has to be a pretty dramatic experience. Or are they getting used to it by now? I don't know if they would ever get used to it. Would you? I don't know. Let's find out. Okay. So then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. <laughs> Don't you just love these people? They whine loudly about stuff that, <clears throat> number one, is painfully obvious, and number two, isn't everybody dealing with the same issue? So, and the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat, and when we ate bread to full, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, they just whined about the water and the bittersweet, and they just whined about the seriously, so you're going to cry. So you cried in your bondage. God worked on Pharaoh, but Pharaoh stuck to his guns. On anything that would look like possible weakness, wasn't going to happen. The oppression was so bad. Remember that it brought Moses to the point that he killed an Egyptian guard that was beating on a Hebrew brethren. That's a glimpse of how bad it was. So, oops. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'll rain bread on from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day 
that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. There's another test. This is God going to test. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So remember, we have it because they that way they can rest on on the on Sabbath. So God promises a bread from heaven, aka manna, simple instructions for the people so that they didn't become idle, as idle people get into trouble. Get up each person gathers a certain quota every day. How hard is that? Oh, and on the sixth day, you will gather double the amount so that they can rest in a day and enjoy doing something that's not in the daily routine. So then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, at evening, you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see that you shall see the glory of the Lord for he hears your complaints against the Lord but what are we that you complain against us there you have it God hears your complaints but why complain against Moses he isn't the one leading the show here too bad they haven't clued in on that so also Moses said, this shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning bread to the full, for the Lord hears your complaints which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Just wait, the Lord's going to give you stuff to eat. And again, your complaint he has heard. And he will take care of his people. And Moses also clarifies that their complaints are against the Lord. Moses is just the major pawn in the grand scheme of things. He's just a little man on totem pole. Then Moses spoke to Aaron. Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God. God's promise, not only what he told Moses, but now he is revealing his promise in front of the tribes. So it was that quail came up in the evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, the dew laid all around camp. Now you have your bread and water and your food. And now here's the directions for your food. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And we know what it's compared to flavor-wise, and we will see um, what, he, what the Lord has done. And this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person. According to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Okay, so here are the instructions, which FYI, this is a test. God's asking, will you follow the simple, simple rules, simple instructions? 
then the children of Israel did so and gathered some, some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. So, down so, so far so good. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and it stank. Moses was angry at them. Moses knows. And there you go. With everything you just witnessed, would you seriously go against God's word? Um, with everything he's capable of doing? Seriously? Why is it some people don't get a clue until after they've incurred the wrath? And then they act like you were overboard in your actions to them. It's like you watch, it's like, hey, you watched rods come alive, turn into snakes, and eat each other. Like all the other magicians' rods that had turned into snakes. And then you watched a river turn to blood, a plague of flogs, lice, flies, sores, sore, the sores on people and cattle. Three days of darkness, so dark, you could feel it. Kill, and then... The last one, killing of the firstborn. That was before you left Egypt. What about the parting of the Red Sea? <laughs> that was just not a week, you know, barely. And they're standing, they're, they're still standing there acting like they weren't told. And how to take care of themselves with provisions God gave them. Doesn't that sound like a lot of people today? So, oops, back up. So they gathered it, and every morning, every every man according to his needs. And when the sun became hot, it melted. Too bad all the garbage we create in our disposable society doesn't just melt away when this, even in this heat. But eventually everything's going to melt away that comes in revelation and so it was on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread two omers for each one and all the rulers of the congregation came and told moses said i guess we had some people watching because they came and told moses that Two omers, you don't need to yell us anymore. We all got our double portions for the day. Now what? Because we were told not to keep or gather extra. I think Moses got their attention. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has to say, has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil. And lay up for yourself all that remains to be kept until morning. Rest up. God's got this. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded. And it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. And then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day the Sabbath, there will be none. So gather what you need, no more, no less. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather. Oh, come on. But they found none. Hey, I, I didn't write it. It's like, where's the stamp? There's your sign. Yeah. So it wasn't enough on the first day to learn that it'll get wormy and rot when you tried to hoard it for later. And you were told to get enough for two days on the day of rest. But no, let's keep failing those simple, simplest of instructions and tests that God has. Simplest. They went out there and found none. Well, I bet they felt stupid. 
It wasn't like they weren't told. <laughs> yeah, it's like, come on, it's even getting redundant in the Bible. Oops, back up here. Um, and then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Really? How hard was this one? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Here, let me spell this out for you. Yeah. Let me just write it real slow in case you can't read fast. Yeah, there we go. And the house of Israel called called its name manna. And it was a white, it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Hmm, kind of sounds interesting. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. When God keeps repeating things, he also each time gives more detail into his explanation Re layering like revelation he just peels back you know here I'm gonna give you this next I'm gonna give you the you know the more times you hear something the more you start understanding it we hope Some people. unless your hearts and mind get a little hard but yeah. and the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land they ate manna until they came to the border of Canaan now an omer is one tenth of an ephah and an ephah is 4.8 gallons an omer is just shy of a half gallon Okay, so that kind of gives you a today's measurement of how much they they got. So now we're going into chapter 17, the water from the rock. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. And then they camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Like Moses isn't having to deal with the same situation himself. Um, but they got to complain to somebody. Yeah. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. I mean, you talk of some melodramatics. And the Lord said to Moses, Go before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand the rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, I want to make sure you guys 
all know about this and the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how of this is all God. Love it. This rock, which by all evidence looks like it fits the description and accounts of the Bible. So he called the name of the place Massah, M Meribah, and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? You should have left your pets at home, Jerry. Well, tell your get your pet to lay down like these other two over here. <laughs> so, so is the Lord among us or not? Okay, um, about this show and God is there, but hmm, let's see if we can notice something here in the next verses. Is the Lord with among us or not? So, there we go. Now the Amalekites came and fought with the Israel in Rephidim. A brief history about the Amalekites. Amalek was the son of Esau via his father Eliphaz. Eliphaz and Eliphaz's concubine Timnah. While the Jews were still at Rephidim, finally trying to recoup from everything they had just been through, the nation of Amalek launched a surprise attack on them. I'm sure they didn't have phones and stuff back then, so it took a few weeks for that news to get around about, did you hear these people crossing the sea and it split for them? And all the Egyptians, they disappeared. So, and Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So, hey, Joshua, go grab some guys and I will take the rod of God, stand on the hill, and you go win this one for the team. Um, keep following here. So Joshua did just did as Moses said to him and fought with Am the Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hands, the Is Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. Okay. But Moses is... Now, we're going to finish this out. But Moses' hands became heavy, so that they took a stone and put it under him, and, sat, and he sat on it. And then Aaron and Hur supported his hand, one on one side and one on the other. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Sounds like something a little different going on here. But let's, uh, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Um, I'm going to give you another view of this area with this little and some visual description going on here. This is amazing, folks. We are at the split in the Slit Rock.
we are just down the road from the giant split rock that Jim and Penny Caldwell found at the base of the western side of the Horeb Range. Now, this is known on the maps as Jebel al Laws, and this range is the Mountain of God. Now, in modern times, we name every single peak and every geological and geographical feature, but back then, they would just name the region, and sometimes they would call a whole mountain uh, range of peaks uh, one name. And so you find that in the Bible. The Israelites were encamped at Rephidim, but also says that they were encamped at the mountain of God when the miracle happened with the water coming out of the rock and when they fought the Amalekites and when Jethro came here with Moses' family. He says he met Moses as they were encamped at the mountain of God. And then from there, they left Rephidim and finally camped in front of Mount Sinai. And so there's two different campsites, but both are mentioned as being camping at the mountain of God. And so the only way that can be true is if you're camping on different sides of the same mountain. And you find this to be a match for that biblical record. You find this site to be a giant plain. It's on the northern route around the mountain range. And it's a very dry region. And you find this huge stone rock at the base of the western side of Mount Sinai. Now this rock is on the western side of the Jebel el Laz range, which we believe to be the area of Horeb, or the mountain of God. Now it was at this area that the Israelites complained for having the lack of water on their journey to Mount Sinai. Now they encamped on the eastern side of the mountain, but here on the western side, it's a much lower elevation and a higher temperature most of the time of the year. And so you can see why they would complain about lack of water and the heat over here. One thing you will notice is that this rock stands out. It is one of the, the biggest natural features in this area. You have this giant rock on a hill and it's split right down the center of it. Um, and at the base of it, you do see erosion on the rock surrounding it. Now, some have said that oh, this was just natural erosion from wind and rain. Um, but at the same time, you know, if that much water was coming out of split rock, it could have eroded the same rock um, much quicker and then of course natural erosion could still have occurred. What is really interesting is that this rock is at the western side of Mount Sinai so they were still encamped at the mountain of God on the other side of the mountain so it fits exactly what the Bible says in Exodus where it says that the Israelites were encamped at the mountain of God when Jethro met with Moses at Rephidim and then they left Rephidim and finally made it to the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in front of Mount Sinai for 11 months. And so that would have been on the other side of the mountain range on the eastern side. Well, we've made it now to the base of the Slip Rock and you can see what a view we have. We're here in Rephidim on the western side of Mount Sinai and all around us you see these giant plains where the Israelites would have encamped and the battle with the Amalekites would have happened somewhere. And of course, you do have the giant split rock of Horeb. And so as the water came out of this area, it would have flowed out into the encampment of the Israelites and given everyone plenty of water for the time they encamped here. And you can see how these rocks here have this erosion going on. Now, there are many rocks in this area that are deformed and eroded from um, obviously natural causes. You have the wind um, coming through here a lot and some rain. But if there were rivers of water coming out of this split rock, like the Bible says, then this erosion would happen a lot quicker, and you would still have it to this day, even with the natural erosion on top of it. This is amazing, folks. We are at the base of the split, and you can see it goes all the way through this giant rock that's sitting high on this hill. And this is where the Bible says Moses struck the rock, and water came out in the sight of all of Israel. Now this giant rock is standing on a high hill that overlooks this giant plain that we were just exploring earlier today. Now this is the area of Rephidim where the Israelites encamped and complained about the lack of water and where they fought the battle with the Amalekites. Now as you can see, the sun is going down behind this split rock that is standing here on a pretty high hill. In fact, you can see around me where we have this big plain that we were just exploring earlier. So, 
that. I like that one picture where he's standing in front of the rock and they pan up. That really gives a kind of a, whoa, that rock is big. I mean, you know it's big, but that kind of gives it a little bit more perspective. So that kind of gives you, you know, where, where all this transpired. Um, so the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount in it the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly brought out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. Okay, here is the first note to write it down. We talked about degrees of separation of who, what and who people could get accounts of and events. And if it wasn't important, why would God start having things really being written down? I mean, we're getting to a point where lives are going to be shorter. Um, messages aren't going to be, you know, yeah, I heard that. You know, I've heard that so many times I can, re I can repeat it backwards. That's the kind of history, you know, that they got. But we know M Moses grew up with the Egyptians, and we know the Egyptians had their hieroglyphics, which Moses would have learned. Even if they had their own language beforehand, Moses is going to learn. So Moses did get the first approximate five years of his life under Hebrew tra traditions. He knew well enough that he was Hebrew. He knew well enough that those were his brethren. So much so that when the oppression got so bad, he killed one. So Moses would have gotten to learn about, very well about Joseph and the family heritage of his great grandfather. Great, yeah, I think it would be great grandfather because if um, when we when we figured out Jochebed, Jochebed was the daughter, uh, last daughter of uh, Levi. So Levi is Moses's grandfather. So that's why you can't have that span of time, the span of time from the being not in the home of Israel, the 430 years began at the promise of, with Abraham and all the, everything that went with it. So let's just touch on Noah. Let's, Noah would have had accounts. He would have been two degrees of separation from Adam. Not, not, he's 10 generations younger, but he could have gotten accounts of Adam directly from Seth. Because Seth, there was five generations of people could have heard all sorts of history from people who knew Adam and Seth. So, um, not, uh, uh, Noah's no, uh, Noah's three kids: Ham, Jepheth, and um, Seth. Yeah, jeez. Uh, so we can see it, anyway. So it goes. He can get direct information from. Let's see. Noah could have gotten it from Methuselah. He could have gotten it from any of the generations because Methuselah did not die until right before the flood. Methuselah knew Adam. So that's why I say Noah was two degrees away. He wasn't one degree. You know, he didn't, he, he didn't get to talk to him, but he did get to talk to somebody who did talk to him. So, But now we can see the effects of how sin is shortening the lives. Oh, and FYI, people, I know that there's those who like to spread the seed of doubt on oral accounts of history. You know, they, they play that um, sentence game. Um, and the only thing that's where I tell you something, you whisper something. And, and, and here's the pro it's, it's, it's a They're playing with short-term memory. A lot of people, when you, if something's first hit you, you see it, and then you have to 
absorb it. You have to, you know, it has to literally go through a process in your mind. So if I were to take you and say the, the little red chicken had a yellow basket and I would say the little red and then make you repeat it and say the little red hen and make you repeat that, then by the time you turn around and told the next person, it would almost be verbatim instead of just saying it and then it, you know and if you some people have photographic I mean real quick memories 98% of us don't and some of us have memory like a steel trap that's rusted shut sometimes I don't want to remember but that's what they try to play with um, oh well that was oral tradition it was like how many times have you been around somebody that repeated the same story and it didn't matter if you came back 20 years later and they were went right in that same story and you could just yeah I remember that and you fell off of this and laughed at that and blah 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 so <laughs> Back in my days, <laughs> so it, it literally repeating it three, repeating parts going three times. You can actually repeat a sentence pretty accurately, but no, your your short term memory, quick, quick, yeah, a lot of people struggle with that. Some more than others. Mine represent that. So Moses built an altar and called its name the Lord is my banner for he said because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation so that'd be Esau hmm? he will be but um, not at this point because um, I'm gonna let me let me go through this and I think it'll lead into that it seems like God allowed the word to get out about the Hebrews that bringing in the Amalek um, back at verse verse 7 they tempted the Lord by saying is he really among us so really again really the plagues weren't a sign the big smoke fire pillar that you're following gives you light by day you know light by night shade by day um you know the, oh that gps system you know spectacular parting of the red seas making bitter water sweet and the splitting of the rock just happened and now and but they still could ask is god with us or not how blind can we be so can you relate to other things that things were so obvious but the forest got lost in all the trees so on to where I'm going with you did you see anywhere on the thing with am on the part with Amalek where God cried out to the Lord where Moses cried out to God prayed to God asked God for instructions whined to God about oh these people came in notice how God allows Moses to help using the rod of God but what happened he had to have help holding it up and holding his arms up Moses got tested there you don't want to call and talk to me Moses is the one that says I will stand up on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand and actually upon thinking about it I believe God said okay you can have the wind but it's going to come with a cost and that would because that wind could not be about the rod of God if God would have done that you know he he couldn't he it, he had to he had to make Moses work for it painfully with help he had to do it because whose arm is the one that did, did all the plagues wasn't Moses wasn't the rod of God it was God it was God's arm 
And Moses is using part of God's arm, but he didn't do it with prayer. He didn't do it with God's guidance. Did the right thing, but he did it the wrong way. Well, so, guilty of that a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Right now. Oh yeah. No, I, 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 I it, it, it was. This was. I mean. God like, oh, hey, you know, I, I, my, the rod ate these and the rod struck the blood and the rod, you know, parted the seas. I got this. I got the rod. So when we step back and look at the picture, we, we can really see our self-destruction there. Because, I, like I said, when God couldn't let that happen, like what happened with the bronze snake, which we'll read, you know, read here coming down. They eventually had to, he eventually had to have that bronze snake destroyed. Because that, that's what God, that's why I believe God allowed Moses to win the fight, but he took it away from the rod. He made, it wasn't just Moses, you know, hey, split the Red Sea and let's go. He had to hold his hand up. And that's, I have to laugh because in a lot of the older movies, when they do the parting of the Red Sea, Moses is like standing there the whole time. No, he wasn't standing there the whole time. It would have said so. Why do I believe that? Because it says here he had to hold up, as long as he held his hands up, they were winning. So as long as he was looking like he was praising God, <laughs> they were winning. But as soon as his hands came down, they started losing. So... I thought that was a uh, good, good move, God. You got it covered. I just, it, it, it was, I, I thought that was quite interesting, you know, that he didn't pray to God, but he allowed him to do it, but he made him work for it. He took, he took everything away that it wasn't the rod of God that made him win. It was Moses standing up with his hands up. Because you knew God wanted them to win, so if he puts his hand down and they got beat by the Amleks, then defeats God's purpose just, just a little. Moses didn't get the full word on that because later on, when uh, they needed water again, the Lord put him to speak to the rock and instruct the rock God like he had before. But he's still using that rod, so. he, yeah, he's he's definitely putting his um, ego into it. You know, I'm upset with the I'm upset with the Israelites. I know you told me to talk to the rock, the, and what's coming up. It's like, yeah, I, I I get it, God. You you want me to just to talk to him? That was Moses' test, and he failed because he struck it. And yeah, that was living water. And at the first time, it was like, yeah, strike it for the the ambiance on a big rock. Um, I do have video for the next one, and I'm not showing it until we talk about it. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So, anyway, yeah. So. There's chapters 16 and 17 of Exodus, and I know we'll definitely do 18, maybe 18, 19. It all depends on what I come up with. I do these, I literally, I study these every week. I, I prepare them during the week. I love it. It, it gives me, it keeps me somewhat out of trouble. Oh, thank you. Does. It keeps me coming back. I, you know, I get bored easy. <laughs> so, anybody want to pray out? Mike. Thank you, Father God, for everything you do. Praise you.